uh, did they intend to spend $2,200 on groceries and they just input it wrong? Trying to figure out what the user wanted to do is probably the most important part because that's the only way you can fix it and make it fit. And the second part of that is any changes you do have to make, you need to be upfront and, op and open and honest about to the users. So you need to tell them why you're making these changes, why what they did before wasn't the right way to use the system, and educate them on how to use it. Because nobody wants to log into their account and see that instead of making $300 last year, they made $400 without explanation. If you're going to change their data, they need to know about it. And you shouldn't change it unless you have a really good reason to. So as an example, that 12.13 yen, we did round those to 12. We didn't have a lot of choice in the matter because we wanted to make sure that our system didn't have the wrong number of, of decimal places for any amount. So we had to tell every user that was affected by that, this is the change that we're making, and this is what you should expect to see in the system. And then came the scaling woes. So one of the things that we realized was we're migrating maybe eight different types of entities from one system to another. Each of them has their own complexities and their scale. So a person may have three invoices a month, but they may withdraw from their credit card 100 times a month. And so the processes and the systems that move over those withdrawals, we probably want to have more horsepower there than the invoicing section, because there's a lot more data to move over. And we wanted these to be independently scalable so that we don't have to waste a lot of money, and it's just really easy to think about or, or kind of scale the system up uh, little by little to discover what we needed to do for this migration. And we hit a whole bunch of scaling issues when we tried to just hit a bunch of random APIs you know, a thousand times a second all of a sudden that we're used to something like maybe 10 or 100 calls per second. And I'm going to go into that when I get into the pitfall section, a couple of examples of what we hit. And then perfection or bust. So like I said before, these are people's financial records. We can't really afford to change them too much. There's you know, the yen example from before that, yes, we do have to make some changes. But aside from that, we have to find a way to make everything work. And that's when we kind of started uh, the data analysis and the interviews. We want to find out why people were using the system the way they were. Some of these things are still things you can do today on this, on this, old, on this older system. And so we had to plug some of those up. Um, but before we could do that, we needed to figure out how to find a way to allow them to track their expenses the way that they want to. And in addition to that, um, the other thing we wanted to be able to do was provide very little or no downtime because People aren't very excited about accounting. If they go to log in and they can't log in, they're probably not going to come back for another week or month or year. Uh, nobody's, you know, oh, today I get to do my books and I'm so excited that I'm going to find out how I'm doing financially. I wish people were like that because it'd be great, but <laughs> that's just not reality. And so we needed to make sure that we didn't lock people out of their accounts for unnecessary amounts of time. So we wanted that to be on an individual level. So we had to log a user out of their account, spend something on the order of five to 10 minutes in the ideal case, migrating your data, and then allow you to log back in again. And then you know, send you some communication, some emails, some exciting announcements about all the great things you can do on our new system. Um, and for the most part, that is how it goes. We have a couple of users who are a bit larger than that who take 45 minutes or half an hour. Um, but the main goal was to keep that under an hour. So our solution. So first, we had to design a coordinator, which we decided we didn't want to be either system. So we don't want the old system managing this migration, and we don't want the new system manually pulling in this data either. We wanted a separate system that we could write that would orchestrate this whole process, especially because we don't want to introduce all this cruft and load onto our new system because it's in this nice, pristine state. It doesn't need to know about all of these weird inconsistencies. And it's also harder to write on the older system because it's a bit behind the times, and we wanted to use newer tooling. So we created this new system. We wanted to build it as a pipeline because it's really easy to think about moving data uh, through a pipeline where, all right, so maybe the first four or five stages involve moving all your invoices from one system to another. That involves exporting, importing, validating, and all of all, all the associated steps. And then once we've done that, we're going to go to your bills, you're going to go to your credits, your debits, et cetera. And it's really easy to think about it that way. But that also means when it's time to migrate your users, if they don't have any invoices or bills, and you haven't built that part of the pipeline, you can skip those steps. 
and it's really easy to track A, that you're doing it, and why you're doing it. And similarly, everything needed to be auditable. So again, this is financial data. We wanted to be very careful. But it also really helps us as developers to know what we've done. So if we've moved an account, we want a record of every single thing that we moved, what the old state of it was, and what the new state of it was, and whether we considered it valid. So designing the coordinator. So we called it Harbor Master. It's got a nautical theme, as most things at Wave do. Uh, it's just how we name our systems. And it was going to coordinate the transfer of data from the old system to the new one, as well as validating the information and ensuring that if we migrated a user, we didn't leave anything behind. So it would go entity by entity. So if you had 1,000 invoices, the pipeline would verify each individual invoice, the before state and the after state. And then at the end, uh, just to ensure that we didn't forget anything, it would validate that everything it moved over was the sum total of what you had in Wave up to that point. And then we built the pipeline. So we split it into export, import, and verification steps, where each of those, each of those steps uh, was coordinated by the system. So it would ping the older system, get it to export the data, do some uh, very simple transforms up front to make that an easy thing to do at verification time. And it would upload it to S3. The system would then pick it back up, ingest it, understand what's happened, send it over to the new system. It would import that data have a bunch of results and sort of the final state of those entities, put those back on S3, and then our system would ingest that and do that verification step. And I have a diagram coming up. Uh, everything is auditable. So like I said before, we have weekly, monthly, yearly users. So it's pretty reasonable for someone to log in eight months from now, having not seen the system since we upgraded, and have a question. I thought I had an invoice in September 3rd, 2013. OK. That's not super easy for us to answer if we don't have a really good audit trail. We need to be able to say either, you know, maybe this invoice was already deleted. Maybe we can't find any trace of it ever existing. But to answer those questions, we need to know every action that we've taken. Because if we did make a mistake, having this audit trail allows us to recover from it. So let's say we did skip invoices with amounts of 1,000 for some reason. Someone added an if amount 1,000 skip. That'd be kind of weird and unfortunate. <laughs> But if they did, uh, this audit trail means we can go through both the old system and the trail and ensure that uh, anything we skipped, we can now import successfully and sort of contact those users and let them know uh, what happened. And then, so this was Harbor Master that I talked about. The wording is too small. But it essentially just uh, communicates that the systems uploaded their data to S3, and Harbor Master would uh, download that to do its verification. And one of the reasons we chose S3 is because it has a really good uh, audit log for us. But also, if you've ever had to communicate you know, thousands of invoices over the wire, that's not really easy to do on your systems, especially if you're using queuing mechanisms, so everything in your pipeline can be asynchronous. You don't want to put a message on RabbitMQ that's a bajillion megabytes. It's not going to handle all this very well, especially if you want to fire a few million at it. And then the pitfalls that we hit. So we hit some snags along the way. As I said before, software can scale well, but it doesn't have to. Uh, the mythical man migration, the problems with adding people to a team when you're in the middle of a large scale project, and then the importance of team morale. So we hit three particular scaling woes that I'm going to touch on. Uh, number one, database connections are running out in your Django app. That's what our ops engine team let us know. So I don't know if you were here two years ago, but I did give a talk on database sharding so that uh, in order to scale our systems, we split our data across many databases. In our case, we have 128 of them. Now, every Request only needs to talk to one of them. Unfortunately, by default, Django will connect to all 128. And that means you have less than 1% efficiency, and you're wasting a lot of connections. Now, this is made even worse by the fact that each of those 32 databases are on one machine. So now you have roughly 31 or 32 wasted connections per machine that you're hitting. So you can't even connect to all 128 that many times. It's uh, divided by 32. So you can hit this r limit pretty easily. Uh, and we ended up kind of scaling our way out of it. We haven't yet tweaked Django, but that's kind of something we want to do. Uh, alarms are going off all over when you turn your migration on. The on-call person got really angry when after a few weeks of being silent, we decided we wanted to move faster and turn the concurrency of our migration up to 150 users at a, at a time. Uh, we hit a very interesting snag with our authentication team. So they'd written an endpoint to log a user out. Now Django, by default, on their session table, doesn't store the user ID associated with that session. 
So th what the endpoint would do is it would read every single session into memory, decode it, check which user was assigned to it, and then remove it if it was that user. Obviously, when you want to move eventually to 1,000 users per second, or even at 150, concurrent table scans are not a very good solution. It was really slow. It was bogging the system down and causing alarms to go off. Uh, and we ended up going with an iterative approach instead, where um, in our middleware, every time you try to make a request, we added a five, a five millisecond delay where we check if you're in the middle of this process. And if you are, we log you out on demand. And now, instead of bringing the system down, we just barely noticed imperceptibly slowed it down. Uh, and we sort of found a, a solution to that. And lastly, my queue isn't meant to be flooded with subtasks. Celery and RabbitMQ, you can't just put three million subtasks on. Uh, contrary to my belief as a naive computer science student and how a queue should work, you can't just keep putting things on a queue. Machines have limits, and they don't behave the same way when you exceed those limits. They slow down, they drop messages, really weird things happen. Uh, so as a result, we had to kind of paginate or chunk our migration into, into cohorts and groups as a way of getting around this problem, because we didn't really see a, a nice scaled solution. Then there's the mythical man migration. Adding people to a project is always going to slow you down. There's a lot of domain knowledge, especially in a system uh, like accounting. In most software, you do have a pretty complicated domain. Uh, sometimes you're lucky and it's not uh, too hard to begin with. But with accounting, people have to understand credits and debits, deposits and withdrawals, how all of these things interact together. And as a result, there's this maybe one or two month period where you're not moving very fast. And there isn't really much that you can do other than keep training those people and focusing on it. So not only are they not contributing at the speed of anyone else on the team, they're going to slow down the team because they have to contribute to their onboarding. So the first thing that's going to happen when you add someone new to a project, especially if a deadline is approaching, is you're just going to slow down. And maybe two or three months later, you'll start picking back up at your normal pace a little bit faster because you now have this extra hand. And so you should try to avoid adding people onto the team unless they're going to be there for the long haul. So if your deadline's in two weeks, you don't really have time to contribute. And if you don't have an option, let's say that deadline is fixed, um, you kind of have to be prepared to swallow some tech debt. Because you, if you don't have time to onboard them, you don't have time to explain, they don't have time to understand how the system works or how you traditionally build it, they're basically just adding appendages onto the system rather than uh, writing it in, a, in the maintainable way or the way that the team normally would. And so if you need to add people to the system, you need to be prepared for this slowdown. And what we found was the best way to mitigate that was to kind of pair, the, pair people together. So if we had a new person, we chose a specific person to handle the onboarding. And that way, at least only one of our uh, members was slowed down for that period. Uh, because sometimes you just have to add people to the team. Um, I also don't recommend adding uh, short-term help to the team. So if you've got a deadline six months away and you can use two months of help from someone on another team, it's going to lead to those same problems. Uh, so in general, try to get help from people that you can, uh, you can keep for the long haul. And lastly, team morale. So I'm not going to touch on everything on this Venn diagram. It kind of just made a really nice backdrop for this, for this section. Uh, but I'm going to touch on a few things. So throughout the life of this project, we hit a bunch of unfortunate snags. Uh, we had deadlines we had to hit, some negotiable, some not. And when you make people move faster, there's a couple of things you begin to notice about the team. So in our case, our team likes to go for coffee, as a lot of people do. So we like to take maybe 15 minute breaks a couple of times a week to go to the coffee shop. Uh, often we're going to talk about whatever we're working on at work. Sometimes it's whatever we're doing outside work. Uh, but it's our way of de-stressing and our, our way of handling this. And one thing you have to pay attention to as deadlines approach and these things happen is not to let these things slip away. It's the little things on the team that they do that kind of keeps morale up. It makes people feel better about the project they're working on. And deadlines have a really nasty effect on that uh, collective ownership. Because if you have to move fast and you can't be proud of what you're building, uh, nobody likes that. Nobody likes to build things that suck or don't scale well or just don't meet the standard that they've decided all software should meet. And so this has a really, really poor effect on morale. And we actually did lose uh, two or three people across the course of this entire project. It's been a year and a half now. And we went through some tough times. And we're in a pretty good place now. Over the past few months, everything's been pretty great. And we found this flow where we're kind of rushing, but we're not rushing the team. Um, and it's very, very important. And lastly, what I want to touch on 
is one of the processes our team does that I really, really like. So we have this process called uh, point of contact where every six weeks you spend about two and a half days on call. That means if the support team needs something from you, if another team needs something from our team, um, or there are any questions for our team from outside, that person is going to field them. This does a few things. One, it trains a lot of the newer members of the team in how to do all of these processes, because if the site does go down for some reason, um, they're going to be the first point of contact. They're going to try to, to fix it, and they can always get help from someone on the team if they need to. But when you're not being interrupted, which is most of the time, so maybe two out of those two and a half days, you have the freedom to do anything that contributes to our overall engineering health. That could be tackling some technical debt you're interested in. That could be learning a new technology or uh, prototyping something that you think we could use in the system. Anything that can overall level up the engineering of our team or individual members. And as a result, this has a huge effect on team morale. And it's not just that we get to do the things that we want to do, it's that we have the freedom to do that. So we don't feel, even in time crunches, that the time crunches are so bad because we can still take that time off to do what we're interested in. And all of, these, all of these types of processes that we do really help us feel better about our state. And as a result, our retention has never been better. And our general happiness has, uh, as we've tracked recently, been very good. So uh, there were a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but obviously time was a constraint. So thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully this is not where you find yourself right now, which is kind of where we felt three years ago, where the company thought, all right, everything's great. You're building this new accounting feature, and you know, you're hitting all your targets. And we're like, no, can you see the smoldering wreckage of a system behind us that we don't, we don't know how to use anymore? So if you do find yourself in that state, please you know, try, try to plan out how you might upgrade or uh, replace that system. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask in front of the room, uh, come on up and ask them into the microphone so that uh, the recording will capture them. Hey, my question is, when you did this migration, did you build into your new system future migration? So learning from, oh, we built this, not expecting to migrate in the future. Did you plan for that for iteration three? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so one of the features of our system that we really, really uh, like that I didn't really get to talk about, the design of it, uh, is we went from a standard kind of active pattern in our database to an event sourcing model so that we can capture kind of the user's intent at every step and we have a history and audit trail of what they did. Uh, and one of the systems that we built on top of that is what we call Reflow. Uh, so we often can't anticipate what new, newer features are going to come out or how we want to change our data. So we do have a system that replays all the historical events, and we can basically reconfigure the database to match whatever information we're looking for. If it's something we can derive from previous events, we have a versioning system where we, uh, on demand, as we read an event, we upgrade it to the latest version. So if it was, let's say, missing date modified because we weren't tracking that, we'll give a best guess based on uh, what, we, what information we have available. And then we'll just, for now on, add it to that event log. Uh, thanks for the talk. Really enjoyed it. Oh, uh, I was kind of curious for the, the point of contact uh, kind of prototyping work that you enable like the on-call to do. Um, do you have any guardrails for like work that's kind of like off limits for that? Like do you stop people from working on actual sprint work or actual like whatever's mm -hmm. actually going on for, for the rest of the team? Because I'm interested in doing something similar on my team. So curious. Uh, yes, actually we do. We have a pretty strict uh, no sprint work policy. It's basically just enforced through I, I guess almost hazing, not, but not really. Uh, like there's, there's nothing to technically keep you from doing that, but we will co consistently remind people that there is absolutely no pressure uh, to work on uh, your regular work. And a lot of the types of things people tend to work on is, uh, for example, MyPy. We added it to the project because we didn't start with it. Uh, TypeScript to our front end. Um, we've been prototyping um, getting off of Celery and RabbitMQ and using uh, different mechanisms. So really anything that interests the team. Some people even just like to read technical documents. They don't, maybe they don't, they don't know a lot about Postgres and they want to know more. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how we do it. Any more questions? That's cool. 
Uh, just a follow up <clears throat> on your answer you just gave. What alternatives to Django Celery MQ are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the main reason that we're looking for alternatives is we are seeing some strange behaviors. So when we do run that reflow, for example, on all our millions of users, we notice that maybe 10,000 out of that million don't end up in the state we want them to, and we, we have a way to check if they're in a good state and just run it again. We feel like this may have to do with dropped messages or something strange. So we want something that can give us a guarantee uh, that our messages were consumed. So right now, um, Alex Tucker, who's giving a talk later today, is kind of heading uh, the process of trying to figure out how we can use, uh, I think, Kafka uh, and some sort of act tracking to figure out a, if we're dropping messages, and B, to make it even easier to replay the history of our events, because that's more suited for an event stream than just firing a million messages at RabbitMQ. We have time for one more question, if anyone else has one. Cool. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. You mentioned you had a deadline. Was it uh, <laughs> self-imposed, or did it come from outside? Or? Uh, yeah, so this was actually something I wanted to talk about in this talk originally. I had to remove the slides for time constraints, among other things. And uh, yeah, so sometimes those deadlines are self-imposed. The, the kind of important thing we found when it came to deadlines, at least for the kind we were setting, was they were supposed to be about uh, goals you can actually achieve rather than just arbitrary numbers. So if your goal or the deadline is to migrate maybe 90% of your user base from one system to another, that's not a great goal. It's not something tangible. You can, you can only plan based on the uncertainty you have. Uh, so we tried to break our deadlines down into, all right, this is what we know today. If we do these three or four uh, features or fixes, uh, we think this will get us to 90%, so we're going to set a goal for next month to finish these four things. It may result in getting us to that 90%. It may not. Uh, and typically, that's how we set our own goals. There were some outside goals, unfortunately, that we kind of had to deal with, where it was like, all right, you have to ship this by this date, or you have to have a certain number of users over. Uh, but typically, we try our best to work with uh, management to figure that out, rather than just kind of uh, last minute time crunch goals. Cool. Uh, let's thank Joseph one more time. <laughs>